Order. Members are welcome to this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on the Response to COVID-19. Agenda item one <coughs> excuse me, is the minutes of the proceedings of the previous meeting held on the 14th of May. Members are asked to note these minutes, which I have agreed. Members should also note that the minutes of evidence from that meeting have been published in the official report and are available on the committee's web page. Agenda item two is a statement from the Minister for Education, Mr Peter Weir. The Speaker received notification on the 15th of May that the Minister wished to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement which the Minister intends to deliver is included in your pack at page 7. I would like to welcome the Minister of Education to this meeting of the Committee. Before the Minister makes his statement, <coughs> excuse me, I want to remind members that following it there will be an opportunity to ask questions, not make speeches. Members who ask short, sharp, focused questions will be invited to ask a supplementary question if they wish to, although they are under no obligation to. Members who engage in preambles, however, may find that they do not get the opportunity to put a, quest a supplementary question. I would ask members for their cooperation in this matter. I would also ask the Minister for his cooperation in keeping answers short, sharp and focused. I call the Minister for Education, Mr Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. It is good to see the power has not gone to your head at all. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, I don't write. I don't write the script, Minister. <laughs> uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, thank you for this opportunity to update the ad hoc committee for the second time on the work that has been undertaken in the education section in response to COVID-19. In opening, may I express uh, my sincere gratitude to all those who work in early years, schools, youth, and the wider educational sectors for their vital and ongoing contribution at this very difficult time. We are now in the ninth week of lockdown. In these unprecedented times, the education sector has faced many challenges. In a very short time frame, we have put in place policies and procedures to ensure that we continue to meet the uh, learning needs of our pupils as best we can. Throughout this period, we have prioritised the physical and mental health and well-being of the young people in our care and that of our staff. Our teachers, school leaders, youth workers and other educational partners are continuing to do an excellent job in supporting our children and young people in their families. My department's COVID-19 strategy supports the executive strategy and plan. I have been in regular contact with ministers in England, Scotland and Wales to share information and discuss our respective approaches to educational provision uh, during this pandemic. Our schools and preschool education settings have remained open to facilitate remote learning and to ensure that there is provision for vulnerable children and for children of key workers up to the end of year 10. Youth services have also continued to provide support to vulnerable young people. Since Easter there has been a rise in the number of, of children attending uh, open schools and although the numbers may fluctuate, uh, on average about 450 settings have been open daily with about 2,000 staff supervising uh, supported learning for around 1,700 children. The work of the whole education sector has continued to focus on six priority areas, namely pay, free school meals, support for vulnerable children, distance learning, examinations and support for key workers. My department has also worked with the Department of Health in developing the childcare sector support scheme. Previously, I advised members of a cohort of substitute teachers um, to avail of any financial support uh, through any government schemes related to COVID-19. I have been acutely aware of the concerns of this substitute uh, teaching workforce who no longer have access to secure work. When Her Majesty's Treasury confirmed that these staff were not eligible uh, to be furloughed through the coronavirus job retention scheme, I reiterated the support, uh, the urgent need for funding from the executive for an income support scheme estimated at around £12 million. The executive confirmed on Tuesday that it is to provide uh, part funding to the scheme of four millions, and I've reprioritised my 2021 education budget to meet the balance of eight million pounds. I'm delighted to advise members that the department launched the income support scheme for substitute teachers on Tuesday. 
The scheme will ensure that eligible teachers, eligible substitute teachers who have worked between the 1st of January 2020 and the 31st of March 2020 will have access to income for the period April to June uh, 2020. Uh, applications should be made online via the Department's website by Tuesday the 26th of May. Turning to direct payment scheme uh, I introduced for families whose children are eligible for free school meals. Around 55,000 families have received direct payments into bank accounts from the Education Authority in respect of nearly 99,000 uh, children. However, there are, were a number of families for whom uh, we could not make direct payments. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am pleased to say that the EA is now issuing individual cheques to over 1,600 families for almost 2,500 children, and payments are to be backdated to the 23rd of May 2020. We also have uh, an agreement with the Home Office to make payments to asylum seekers' families uh, through the Aspen card. To date, we have uh, made payments, including backdated payments, to 46 families for 82 children. And to date, free school meal payments in the region of £10.7 million have been made in respect of around 101,500 uh, children. While schools remain closed to the majority of pupils, the EA continues uh, to be unable to provide school meals to children in type of free school meals. A further notice under the Coronavirus Act has therefore been made today, uh, renewing for a further period of 28 days the existing modifications to the legislation governing school meals. This will allow the EA to continue to make direct payments to parents in lieu of free school meals and ensure that families do not experience hardship during school closures. Uh, the numbers continue uh, to rise as more families find themselves eligible for free school meals. The scheme is due to close uh, with effect from the 30th of June. My department does not provide free school meals over the summer holidays. And whilst the, uh, the Department for Communities has lead responsibility for vulnerable families, no single department has the lead on food poverty and holiday hunger. So it will be for the executive to decide on the way forward over the summer holidays and to make provision for the necessary funding to support any interventions. The Department of Communities has announced a number of additional measures to provide food and assistance to vulnerable groups, and we continue to work closely with them to ensure food is available to those vulnerable children. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, as part of the voluntary, community, voluntary and community sector, the Education Authority Youth Service is delivering the Eat Well, Live Well programme with funding provided by the Executive. This provides healthy meals for 3,100 vulnerable young children who remain at risk of hunger despite free school meal direct payments. A food box is delivered uh, to each young person's home each week with a box containing provisions for five breakfasts and five lunch. Demand has been exceptionally high and the programme reached its maximum capacity within three days of operating. While the youth service has the additional staffing capacity to increase its, its provision, new registrations and referrals were closed on the 29th of April in order to remain within the allocated budget. Young people remaining in need are referred to other local food providers, such as the food banks, the Department for Communities, local councils, and other community-based responsibilities. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I prioritise support for vulnerable children, their parents, and carers. I appreciate that school is a protective factor for many vulnerable children. Vulnerable children have been facilitated to attend school where it's in their best interests and safe and appropriate to do so. The numbers attending school here remains low, at approximately three to 400 a day, but that figure is increasing. The Education Authority is providing a weekly report to the Department on the support it is providing to vulnerable children and young people. From the 11th of May, the Education Authority is providing an additional mechanism through which social workers, parents or guardians may seek a school place for a vulnerable child. Requests for placements are being processed by the health and educational professionals. The EA has, EA has also established five virtual safeguarding vulnerable children's groups aligned with the five health uh, trust areas. These groups ensure that appropriate safeguarding and child protection referrals are being made. In collaboration with the, the PSNI, the EA Youth Service has provided uh, spaces of sanctuary for young people at risk of domestic or child abuse. My department is also contributing to the Department of Health's cross-departmental Vulnerable Children um, Action Plan. This uh, plan aims to uh, provide the, promote the safety and well-being of children and young people within their home and within the wider community. 
a multidisciplinary joint uh, planning process uh, between education and health for children with complex needs who attend special schools is progressing on a trust-by-trust -trust basis and includes special school principals. Turning now to school admissions for the next academic year. Primary placement letters issued at the end of April and post-primary placement letters will issue in June. However, open enrolment does not apply to pupils with statements of special educational need. As a result, children with, with statements of SEN and profound uh, multiple learning difficulties, severe learning difficulties with complex medical needs or a severe learning difficulty have been identified through the statementing process as priority groups for admission to special schools for the 2021 20, academic year. Children with statements of SEN have also been prioritised through the statementing uh, for preschool admission, P1 and post-primary transitions uh, from P7 to Year 8. Officials are continuing to work towards implementation of the new special educational needs framework, which will introduce new regulations governing the statutory assessment process. I had intended to consult on both, these, both the draft regulations and the draft code of practice this spring. That launch date is obviously uh, currently under review. Work is continuing on the health and, well-being, health and emotional well-being framework for education. The target date for completion is December 2020, but again, that will also be kept under review in terms of time. In terms of the type of support provided in the current context, the following measures have been put in place. The Independent Counselling Service for Schools uh, is continuing to provide counselling to existing and new post-primary pupils, either by telephone or video call. The Education Authority's Youth Service has created a Stay Connected initiative online to remotely uh, support young people as a result of COVID-19. And within the first uh, four hours, the site registered 1,450 views. Additionally, schools are using assessment tools to identify emotional needs in children and young people where concern has been raised. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, in April, we launched the Safer Schools app. This is a digital safeguarding and communication toolkit for schools, staff, parents and carers. Last Friday, the Safer Schools app for children and young people was launched, providing age appropriate advice on a range of digital issues, including safeguarding uh, on social media platforms, bullying, sexting and emerging online trends. In addition, uh, my department provides uh, funding to support the NSPCC Childline operation here in Northern Ireland. I appreciate that this, that this crisis is impacting on the mental health and emotional well-being of our children and young people, and I will be considering how best we can support them when they return to school. Mind that, mindful that many will face higher levels of anxiety and distress, and will need help with the transition back to school and the impact on the prolonged absence. The Youth Service also provides support to vulnerable young people. Provision includes one-to-one -one support, online support and communication uh, via a new youth online website, one-to-one -one support where appropriate and in a safe way, and support for young people experiencing mental health difficulties. The START programme is continuing to support young people under paramilitary threat. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, providing continuity of learning for our young people is a key focus for the education sector. With very little uh, notice, schools were able to make a rapid transition to distance learning. This reflects not only the skills and motivation of our teaching workforce, but also highlights the strengths of our system. Unlike other education systems, we have in place an educational technology system which is effectively supporting online learning. Through C2K, the Education Authority delivers a comprehensive range of tools to support teaching and learning. This includes providing devices for teachers and pupils, secure learning platforms, centralised uh, learning resources and professional development resources for teachers. Advice from the Education and Training Inspectorate points to the need for distance learning provision, which is broad and balanced, and which emphasises the need for a balance between online learning, written and practical activities, outdoor learning and free time. Reflecting this advice, uh, feedback from school leaders has pointed to a wide range of strategies and resources being adopted by schools. The finding of a, of a recent survey confirmed a blended approach with all schools engaged in distance learning using either online or alternative approaches, and many were using both. In special schools, packs which contain sensory or physical equipment have been supplied to pupils who need them. And I would like also to pay tribute to parents and carers who are supporting their children's learning during this period. 
I noted in the findings of a recent survey by ParentKind that the support parents find most helpful for their children is communication from the school and feedback from the teacher. As well as the C2K facilities, many schools are using digital tools such as their own school text services, websites, social media channels and individual school apps to communicate with parents and pupils. This is going to, to continue to be very important in the coming months as we move towards a more blended approach to learning with time spent in the classroom and at home. Another strength of our system is the availability of support from our managing authorities and support bodies. Designated link officers are assigned to each educational setting. Those officers help school leaders remain connected to the wider educational community. They deal with issues as they arise and signpost schools to resources and guidance. Through a programme of work focused on the continuity of learning, the uh, whole education sector has ensured that appropriate action is taken to support the learning progression and well-being of our children and young people. Consulting widely with principals, our education partners have worked extremely hard to develop a wide range of resources to support distance learning. These have included online resources on C2K's educational network service, guidance and advice to parents and carers on educational websites, support materials for parents uh, of children attending preschool, primary and special schools, and third-party funded organisations providing curriculum support and learning opportunities for young people. A recent survey of parents highlighted that almost 50% have used BBC resources to support home learning. I'm also pleased to report that my department and CCEA are working with the BBC on further uh, resources which alongside CCEA's home learning resources may be helpful for schools, parents and carers. Now, the situation is not without its challenges. We do not know the final impact of the current crisis on children's safety, well-being and learning. But as I've outlined, we have begun from a strong starting point. It is important that we acknowledge the steps that have been taken across the education system in all settings to mitigate the risks of any loss of learning. Working in this context, uh, we are now looking strategically at how to support the system in the medium and longer term. Building on what exists and planning for a return to school over an extended period of time and with a blended uh, learning approach. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, as you'll be aware, on the 16th of April, I announced my uh, decision to suspend examinations for A-levels, AS-levels and GCSEs. I made this decision after giving very careful consideration to the full range of options and advice, as well as feedback from key educational stakeholders. On the 7th of May, CCEA launched a consultation on the development of an alternative appeals mechanism for the summer 2020 awarding of GCSEs, AS and A-levels. The consultation can be accessed through CCEA's website and today is the closing date for responses. My officials have been working with CCEA and colleagues across the UK to develop an appropriate arrangement that are robust uh, as well as fair. I'm sure I'm not alone in wishing that we were not in this situation and that the exams continue as normal. However, that is not possible. And whilst these uh, arrangements are not and can never be perfect, I believe they are the best solution that, uh, that is available to us. I would like to thank CCA, ETI and others who engaged with the department at short notice for the hard work as, that has gone into developing these arrangements. My department continues to work closely with the Department for the Economy to ensure that those taking vocational qualifications are not disadvantaged by the cancellation of scheduled exams and assessments. The Minister for the Economy recently announced her uh, policy position in respect of vocational qualifications, and I understand the significant progress has already been made. Last week, the Essential Skills Awarding Organisations were issued with a CCA directive to calculate an award for essential skills. Uh, essential skills. Guidance is already being issued to learning centres. Uh, the Minister also uh, expects, uh, Minister for the Economy also expects the ongoing work on wider vocational qualifications to be completed shortly. I am conscious that some school pupils are at more risk of falling behind in their learning. In response, a scheme has been introduced to lend devices to our educationally disadvantaged and vulnerable learners moving into key transition years. Many schools have already lent out equipment such as iPads and laptops to pupils for their home. Teachers have made direct contact with pupils who have, been, who have not logged on to the C2K network to ensure that they have access to IT equipment. In addition, the Education Authority is engaging with schools in a process to lend digital devices to children from socially disadvantaged backgrounds, 
in particularly those who may be uh, considered vulnerable and those in examination year groups. Subject to the necessary approvals, I am intending to initiate a three-stage process for the allocation of digital devices to children. Stage one, using existing school stock. Stage two, using 3,000 new laptops, which have been procured by the uh, Education Authority. And stage three, if needed, a further 48,000 additional devices. This could provide up to 24,000 devices to be lent out to students over the next few months. I have arranged a range of criteria, prioritising those children in year groups 11, 13, 6 and 3, uh, and who are also eligible for free school meals of special educational needs, are in the newcomer uh, target groups, looked after children and children who are considered vulnerable. Those children who are eligible for free school meals in these year groups but do not meet the other criteria will be considered next for distribution. Finally, and subject to availability, pupils who are eligible for free school meals in other year groups will be considered on a similar basis. Members will be aware that schools are open to provide supervised learning uh, for those children who are vulnerable or uh, whose parents are key workers. More recently, there has been an average daily attendance of around 1,500 uh, vulnerable children and children of key workers at around about four, uh, 450 schools, supported by approximately 2,000 teaching and non-teaching staff. The ongoing development of cluster schools to ensure provision for children has been, been progressing well, and there are currently 131 schools involved in 33 clusters across a wide uh, geographical area. The EA Key Worker uh, Request System had a total of 616 children needing to be placed, and this was reduced to 42 as of the 18th of, of May. Detailed guidance for schools is available on the Department's website. This includes guidance on how to manage social distancing in schools, along with a video produced by the Public Health Agency on hygiene and social distancing in education settings. I would like to reiterate my thanks to the education leaders who are playing their, their part in support, support vulnerable children and children of key workers uh, by opening their schools and working collaboratively with other schools in this unprecedented times. Members will be aware that on the 27th of March, I announced a volunteering scheme to assist the response to COVID-19. To date, there has been an excess of 1,000 volunteers, and the volunteering scheme has been paused. It has not been necessary to call on our volunteers, as our dedicated teaching and non-teaching staff have been coping uh, well. The Department is planning ahead for the holiday period to ensure the availability of provision could potentially avail of, of volunteers during the summer months, should the current situation remain. Uh, coming out of childcare, in relation to the £12 million emergency package for childcare provision for key workers, uh, my ministerial colleague Robin Swan gave an update on this at last week's ad hoc committee, so I won't repeat any of that, except to say that applications for the scheme are now being processed by the Business Service Organisation and a reference group comprising education, health, childcare and parent representatives has been established to monitor progress. My department is continuing to fund non-statutory settings that are in receipt of preschool education funding and Bright Start School Age uh, childcare funding in 2021. I have increased the 2021 Sure Start allocation to £27 million, which is an increase of £1.45 million, to allow services to be maintained at existing levels. Coming to the Pathway Fund for 2021, demand for resources exceeds available supply, and it has not been possible to fund all eligible applicants. To maintain key services for the most vulnerable children, and minimise disruption for providers uh, in the current exceptional circumstances, I have made a bid to the COVID-19 response for additional pathway resource. If successful, the bid would allow funding for all eligible 2021 pathway projects. Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, we are beginning to look to the future. There is a need to help source secure the best possible educational future for all our children in what are extremely difficult circumstances. And while there has been tremendous work done in uh, remote learning over the last two months, it is important that we begin to see recovery and a process-phased reopening of schools. This, however, must be led by medical and scientific evidence to ensure that it is done in a manner and a timescale which is safe for our pupils, our staff and wider society. The pathway to recovery will follow the route outlined in the education sector, section of the executive approach to decision-making document. While all steps were ultimately driven by circumstances and the medical advice, I am aware of the need to give as much certainty as people as possible. So let me set out the likely time frame as regards schools. 
At present, schools are closed to all but the children of key workers and vulnerable workers for supervised learning. This number has been slowly expanding since Easter, and I would be keen to see more vulnerable children attending schools. And similarly, should the executive widen the definition of key workers, this too can be accommodated. But neither of these actions will radically alter the, the pattern of children currently attending, currently at school. The phased reopening of schools will require engagement, preparation and implementation of actions in conjunction with a wide range of stakeholders. We have one chance to get this right and it cannot be done overnight. Therefore, other than for the provisions for children of key workers and vulnerable children, which I've already mentioned, there will be no overall reopening of schools during the remainder of this academic year. The Department is establishing a restart programme which, working alongside a wide range of stakeholders, will put in place the detailed arrangements which will enable a safe, phased reopening of schools. The work on this will be conducted during the remainder of this term and uh, the summer. We must all use the time wisely and constructively. Options will be developed to provide schemes during the summer that will make some provision for our children, particularly focusing on key worker children and vulnerable children, subject to medical gu guidance and compliance with social distancing. Working alongside other departments, we will explore what role the voluntary, community and private sectors can make in making some provision for our young people during the summer. Subject to medical guidance and safety, it will be my aim to see a phased reopening of schools, beginning with a limited provision for key cohort years in August, followed by the phased provision for all pupils at the beginning of September. This will not be a return to school as it was prior to COVID, but rather a new normal, reflective of social distancing and a medically safe regime. For all pupils, it will involve a schedule with a mixture of school attendance and remote learning at home. Finally, in line with the executive strategy and contingent upon medical guidance and scientific evidence around susceptibility and transmission, consideration may be given to a full return for cohorts of younger pupils. In closing, Mr Speaker, may I say this is the biggest public health crisis we have faced in living memory, and the executive's priority is to help keep people safe and support those who have faced real hardship. My department and the wider education sector will continue to play a full part in the ongoing effort, while also focusing on the future for when we return to some kind of normality. I thank the Minister for making his statement. Uh, members, there are 18 uh, members indicating that they wish to ask a question. Uh, question time will last roughly an hour. So, um, if we're talking 18 times 2 for a supplementary, that's 36. It gives you some idea of the time constraints that we're operating under. So, if we could please uh, keep it focused. I call first the Chairman of the Education Committee, Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his detailed statement and assure him the Education Committee will continue to work with him uh, towards ensuring guidance and support for our schools and pupils to maintain equal educational opportunity at this time. The Minister's failure to address post-primary transfer in this statement will cause as much anger as his ill-considered welcome of the inadequate two-week delay to post-primary transfer tests scheduled for November and December of this year. Despite the dedicated and creative work of teachers and parents, it goes without saying that children will be experiencing distance and blended learning in different and unequal ways. So can I ask the Minister how he can justify his support for the requirement of children to sit transfer tests in November and December of this year, and what contingency plans are in place should it not be possible to sit those tests? Well, I thank the member for his support. Um, can I... Uh, uh, can I say, in terms of, look, in, in terms of the remote learning, uh, we're trying to ensure through link workers and also through uh, there will be a key focus. I know it was raised by one of the, the trade union officials this week at, at committee uh, that indeed the focus, particularly for ETI, needs to be particularly on the pedagogy and resources available in terms of remote learning. That clearly is where the focus uh, will be of ETI in trying to ensure there's a level of, of as much consistency as possible. It is also the case, as indicated, in terms of trying to create as much of a level playing field on remote learning as possible, as indicated where there are gaps on the issue particularly of digital resources, uh, the aim is to close those as much as possible. Can we ensure that there will be 
precisely a level playing field for everybody, or that everybody will, do, will be in exactly the same place. No, I don't think anybody can. I think that is the nature of, of things. As indicated, I think in terms of the choices that are there, um, it is clear that as much certainty needs to be provided as possible. This is not an ideal situation in terms of post-primary uh, transfer, but we do have a situation where, first of all, uh, academic selection and the member, myself indeed, others will disagree over the, the merits of this, but is something which schools can use as a means for dealing with oversubscription in terms of selection. It is also the case then that if there is academic selection is available, uh, it is clear that from the robustness of data that it is difficult to see another route in which uh, there is a level of robust data which can be used for academic selection other than a test. And thirdly, that in terms of timing, whereas I appreciate the very genuine concerns that are out there in terms of timing, um, it is the case that, um, uh, that if things were simply pushed back to a much later date, uh, that given the complexities of the processes which need to take place for moving from the point at which results are issued to final placements, um, that working alongside those and examining those, uh, those dates, it appears likely that that would mean that placements would not be able to be made until the middle of July. And given the fact, and I suspect we will have inevitably a higher level of, of, um, uh, of appeals put in place, a situation in which that would lead then to appeals possibly going into the middle of October. Now, if we're saying in terms of certainty for children, in terms of providing as fair and as balanced a position to children as possible, a situation in which some children would not know their post-primary uh, school until some point at which they would already be in year eight, I think is not one which I think is acceptable. That sort of timeline is not one that is there, which I think is where the driver is. Now, as with officials, we will look to see what, if there's anything that can be done to tighten that timetable and make that, that better. This is on the basis of if you're having exams, for instance, in, in January. But it's very difficult to take a great deal of time out of the, the process. There's a range of, I think, 14 or 15 measures that need to take place between even the, the results being issued and the final, um, the final moment of, of placement. It's very difficult to take sufficient time out of that to make that workable if there's a post-Christmas um, exam schedule on that basis. So I think that it is probably the least worst option that, that is there uh, at present, notwithstanding, I think, the wider argument that people will have over whether they use academic selection or not. Mr Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. This isn't about the Minister and I's disagreement in relation to academic selection. This is about thousands of 10- and 11-year-old children across Northern Ireland in their best interests. I have been inundated by people who disagree profoundly that transfer tests should be set during a global health pandemic. So can I ask the Education Minister, will he use his legislative powers to pause the use of these tests for post-primary transfer in 2020-21 if no alternative can be found, as he suggests? Hey, with respect, I have said there is an alternative that is there. If the member is saying, will I be using power to ban academic selection, no, I will not. And the reality will be... Well, with, with respect on it, the, the member is in danger of saying one thing and meaning another thing. Because, frankly, if you're saying, take powers to stop academic selection for this year, you're talking about banning academic selection. If the member wants, if the member wants to abolish all grammar schools, let him at least have the courage of, of saying that. Alternatively, if he doesn't, then provide another means by which selection, because there will be schools that will be oversubscribed, by which selection can then take place. Because it is all very well and everybody is aware of the concerns that are there on this particular um, set of modalities to say, stop it this year, do not do this, but not to provide an alternative to what is there. And I appreciate there will be different views in terms of academic selection to plunge pupils into uh, the, the void of not knowing what will actually replace that. If we are saying that, that certainty is the key message that needs to be got uh, for pupils and for parents, to announce something simply of an abolition without anything in its place, I think, would be highly irresponsible. Mr Little, you got to ask your question. The Minister should have been allowed to answer without being interrupted from you in a sedentary position. That's, that's not appropriate, says Mr Wells from a sedentary position. <coughs> I call Mr William Humphrey. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, before I... I, I ask my question, can I just beg your indulgence? It's good uh, to see 
the Honourable Member for East Antrim in his place today. And can I, can I, on behalf of these benches, assure him of our continued support as a valued and trusted colleague, despite the appalling cowardly threat he received on his life earlier this week? Um, can I uh, thank you very much for the statement that you made to the House Minister? And on behalf of the DUP, thank all those principals, teachers, non-teaching staff and EA staff for all the work that they are doing in this most difficult of time. I congratulate you as well on having secured the extra resource to assist substitute teachers. I represent some of the most deprived consti con the constituents in the United Kingdom in North Belfast, and I raised the issue yesterday about the disparity in terms of learning and access to resource in terms of computers uh, and IT in particular at the committee. So I very much welcome the statement you made today in terms of laptops, in terms of reaching the disadvantaged and vulnerable communities across my constituency and indeed Northern Ireland. Can I ask when this scheme will begin to roll out? Well, I think it's in the process already of rolling out because what is the case? I think a lot of schools proactively where they had um, sort of laptops or computers have already lent them out. There was perhaps a little bit of misconception initially that, for instance, laptops that would be in the school would not necessarily be compatible with the home environment. But in terms of the C2K uh, situation, it's fairly clear that small level of adaptation that can be done. So those have already been uh, lent out. There was already, I think, within the pipeline, 3,000 uh, devices that were being procured by, uh, the, uh, by, the C, uh, by the EA. And indeed, then, what will then be sought uh, will be uh, a movement, a shift towards um, a small amount of capital, because it will not require, in the grand scheme of things, an enormous amount of money. Uh, that will be a reprofiling of a certain small element of capital to ensure those additional devices are there. So the aim will be to provide that. In most cases, I think what we have found by way of trying to survey the evidence, it, where the, the principal problem is not specifically with the household that has no device, it is the fact where a household and there are a number of people trying to use that device and it's about therefore trying to provide that additional bit of support. I think as well, whenever we move back to a, while there will be very big challenges for the, the the workforce. Um, when we move back to a situation in which there is some blended learning between being in school and remote learning, hopefully I think particularly for parents and for children that will enable a better sort of and more seamless um, level of continuity of, of learning. And I suppose we're also looking in terms of uh, continuity of support, what else can be done within the system to provide that, that level where there's been that, that clearly a gap. I should also perhaps also, I forgot maybe at the, the start of answering this, also associate myself with the remarks that the members made in relation to the Honourable Member for East Antrim. I'm glad to see him in his place. Thank you. I call Karen Mullen. Thank you, Minister, for his statement. I also thank you for the work um, yourself and your department is doing over this period. I also want to express my thanks to our teaching and non-teaching staff and our parents and guardians out there. Minister, in relation to free school payments, I agree that no single department has the responsibility um, uh, for leading on food poverty. Um, we collectively must look at how we can continue those payments over the summer, so I'm glad to see it on today's statement. Um, Minister, no doubt you are aware of the intense concern and anxiety that exists out there in relation to the reopening of our schools. In order to address those concerns and to give confidence to the people um, does the Minister agree that parents and young people should be involved in the restart pro programme along with the other stakeholders? And it's, it's vitally important that they're um, involved from the very beginning. I, I, want, I think, and as I indicated um, in another, um, so the, the aim will be, I think, that uh, there will be an overall restart programme. And within that, I think there will then be six work streams, uh, which will deal with perhaps more than nitty gritty. The aim, I think, will be in. Uh, I'm due to consider very shortly uh, the methodology of that, that level of engagement, but there's likely to be engagement, be it by way of a reference group or something at a higher level. There's also then likely to be, because some of it will involve levels of expertise, levels of engagement at the, the more nitty gritty level, and that will involve um, sometimes educational stakeholders. It'll, there'll be a clear role uh, in terms of ensuring that the, the medical and scientific advice is there, because some of the issues will be very medically driven, some will be more education driven. Some will also be very cross-cutting. And so, for example, um, I know myself and the Minister of Infrastructure will need to have, uh, I'm very keen to have high levels of engagement with her, because there will be issues around what happens with TransLink, what happens um, with the, uh, uh, the issue of 
How we, how we marry in a consistency of approach, for instance, between school transport and what is available in school. But there is also a key role for parents and for students. And whatever as well of the direct formal situation as regards levels of engagement and work, you know, I am also indicating that, that I am keen to receive views, have as much interaction as possible with all those who have a level of relevance uh, in terms of stakeholding. So, for example, I had spoken there last week to a group of online uh, principals and doing, again, a similar exercise tomorrow. Uh, next week, there is due to be a question and answer session with some pupils from some schools. You know, there are a range of things, and there will be individual, I would welcome as well, at times individual educational stakeholders who will be contacting either me or the department. Um, because although, I suppose, a lot of us sometimes pretend that this is the case, there is not a monopoly of wisdom within this place or indeed anywhere else. And so, therefore, ideas will be thrown up, uh, that, uh, and above all, solutions will be thrown up from a range of different sources. It is important that we have as much of a consensus moving forward as possible. There will always be people at one end of the scale or the other, some who will want schools entirely to be 100% open tomorrow, others who will not want to see anything happen until there is a vaccine and COVID is out of the way. But I think for the bulk of people, I think, want to see a sensible route that protects our education and protects our health. And so therefore, I look forward to cooperating and working and engaging. And given the sort of timescales that have been put out, I think there is, a, there is that opportunity for engagement, preparation uh, and implementation. Ms Mullen, for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. I think we just touched in relation to the anxiety that young people are facing at the moment. And in your statement, you talk about the time frame for the health and wellbeing framework. And that was set before COVID happened for December 2020. So um, how realistic do you think that we'll meet that time frame? Because I think now more than ever, it's important it's in place. No, I, look, I, the member is right in terms of the importance of this. And I want to move ahead with that as, as quickly as we can. In terms of, I think the problem has been there's been a level of disruption both in terms of consultation and implementation. And to some extent, to sketch ahead precisely where full consultation and full implementation is difficult to do. There will be no artificial barriers to that being put in place. It is also the case that, as we see, as we move ahead, whatever support can be provided within whatever budgets are available uh, for the health and well-being of our young people has, has got to be done. You know, from that point of view, a framework is very useful to be able to provide a strategic direction, but we shouldn't necessarily be waiting on a framework to be able to do some of the things that need to be done. Before I call the next person, could I also associate myself with the comments of Mr Humphrey? I think it's outrageous that a man of Mr Hilditch's standing, who served the people of East Antrim for more than 20 years, should have been threatened by faceless thugs. And we all stand with you, David. I call Mr Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And I also echo your support to the member across the chamber. Uh, there is absolutely no place for such threats. And there are other members in this House who have also faced such threats in, week in recent weeks. And we must stand united against uh, uh, those who, uh, uh, who are uh, adamant in pulling down democracy. Uh, Minister, I would like to thank you for your statement and also to uh, put on firm public record my gratitude to you for the work you have done around substitute teachers. You will know for the last number of weeks that uh, we have uh, swamped your social media and email inbox with some teachers who have shared their stories very kindly uh, with us uh, and their plight as well. I am glad that is now resolved. Minister, just following on from the points of the uh, chairperson of the Education Committee, I am not interested today in the debate of whether we should or should not have a transfer test. What I am interested in is what we do that is right for the children at this particular point in time, given we are in a global health crisis. Uh, there are many parents out there that are very worried, Minister, about the impact uh, of uh, not being able to attend school, obviously, will have on uh, these children. There are some who have been able to avail of tuition uh, and the sorts, and there are others, unfortunately, who have not. There are some who can access, rural broad or can access broadband, there are some who cannot. There are clearly children who will be disadvantaged, Minister, and I do not think it is fair that this test will go ahead uh, during this time. And I think it does raise many questions and will bring about many problems and challenges uh, beyond uh, uh, the test. Yeah, look, I thank the member first of all. I'm not quite sure whether there was actually a question in, in, in that. But, uh, uh, but look, I remember, first of all, in terms of the substitute teachers, yes, I, I were obviously, and particularly I think one of the things I was acutely aware is that while there will be a, at one end of the scale, there are some substitute teachers for whom this is something just that it's very occasionally done for others, uh, and particularly the cohort of the age of a lot of the substitute teachers will be people 
quite often in their mid to late 20s into their early 30s, who perhaps have young families who have particular responsibilities in terms of um, issues around mortgages and for whom they're, they're highly dependent upon um, what is effectively a full-time job in relation to that. So I, I was glad to see that, that happening. Look, it is ultimately about, in terms of transfer, um, trying to ensure that we get the best possible solutions that are, are there for our young people. I think the problem is trying to find practical, agreed solutions uh, that are workable. Because in an ideal world, if, for example, the test could be done and an instant result produced, then I think we would operate in a different time frame. Uh, the fact that even when the tests are done, there will be a period of a number of weeks before actual results are available, as is the case with, with any high-level written test, I think is always a, a degree of, of challenge and difficulties. So it is about trying to ensure that we can get the best solutions, but it's also going to be things that are practically driven. Mr. McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Minister, for answering that. There was a question, but my handwriting is so poor, <laughs> I didn't pick it up. <laughs> it's, uh, in relation to a suggestion that I'd put yourself around the GEL test, has there been any consideration given to that as an alternative to uh, the transfer test? Maybe that would give some ease. It would take away certainly some of the time pressure there and would take off some of the stress. And I think that it's largely accepted it would be a possible good alternative. And I think that would certainly help those children from disadvantaged backgrounds. I understand. I, th I thank the member for his helpful suggestions. I mean, I resist therefore the, the temptation to put him in detention to say, um, I must write my, my, uh, my question out more clearly a thousand times. Um, but look, any suggestion will always be looked at. These are obviously private tests, and there is, um, I think, from a methodology point of view, a wide gap between GL and the PPTC side of things in AQE. Uh, clearly, if there's any level of discussion between the two, but we should remember as well that in terms of timing, the concern, I suppose, has been that the timing in terms of AQE, leaving aside some of the broader issues, has been in a sort of a November and a early December period. We should also remember the GL test is actually scheduled for December as well. So from that point of view, that would not necessarily provide uh, a solution for, from that point of view. And schools have made very clear-cut choices about which one of the two they want to. Now, I have expressed a clear-cut opinion that I want to see at some stage those moving towards, if there cannot be agreement, and there's unlikely to be agreement, of a single state position on it, at least the two organisations should move together. But I think there's a further thing that can be done, which at least will provide some level of reassurance which is I think there's got to be an acknowledgement by both PPTC and AQE that given that there's been a level of disruption to the curriculum, uh, that where they pitch the level of those tests has got to be different this year to where they would do normally. And there's got to be some level of cognizance of the fact that uh, pupils have not been in the position to have the same level of learning experience, notwithstanding all the good things that have happened through remote learning, it is by definition a level of mitigation of what would normally, normally happen. And I think that has got to be reflected in any examinations that are put forward by both those organisations. Mr Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister. And I'd like to just go on record with uh, emphasising the support that, that I have my party, and I'm sure this all, the whole House does, and, and absolutely disgust at the threats that have been handed out to Mr Hilditz and the other members of this chamber of late. They're not acceptable in 2020, and they never were. Uh, Minister, thank you for your announcement today. Uh, I would like to take the credit for that if I could, because it was on Nolan this morning asking for tablets, but I couldn't possibly. Thank you for, for that today. But um, I'm not going to move off the topic that the, most of the committee have been on, and that is AQE. I think it is um, uh, the most important topic that we could be discussing today. Uh, and up to this point, I would say you've been an excellent minister. Um, but I was reading through the notes there, and, and you even mentioned it today, that on the 7th of May, CCAEA launched a consultation uh, on the development of an alternative appeals process, which would be quite a considerable piece of work. And a number of times when we have ch chatted about this issue, the appeals process for AQ and GL testing has been one of the major uh, problems uh, in, the, in the backlog and the, and the time constraints. Uh, could you indicate to me, has that been something that has been considered? Uh, that, and, and why has it not been put forward so far? I look forward to reading the front page of the Lisburn Star, where I'm sure the, the, the member will be suitably modest in, in terms of his role in, in, uh, in claiming anything. Look, I think the, the issue as regards uh, CCEA and their consultation and appeals uh, is of a very different nature uh, to issues around transfer. Uh, the reason being that on GCSE and A levels, firstly, that what is able to be done is based upon a much higher level of robust data. 
So for, if, for example, there is any methodology that doesn't involve a test um, from the point of view of transfer, the only available data, because obviously with COVID, even in terms of any P6 assessments are there, aren't there, you would actually be going back to any data which is there on the basis of a P5 uh, testing, which in and of itself is not a, has been done at times is effectively largely for internal use by schools and consequently is not always done on the same basis. You couldn't have any level of comparability. So the data for GCSE, for ASs and A-levels is, um, is a lot closer to that, but also the nature of the appeals because while there's an ongoing consultation with regards to the CCA appeals mechanism, so there's maybe a limited amount I can say in relation to it, but it is largely to test out, the appeals will largely be focused in on the basis of was the process done correctly? It's sort of almost a quasi-judicial review type situation. For post-primary transfer, and this is irrespective of whether it's selective or non-selective, it's about whether you've got into the school that you, that from a parent's point of view, they got the child into the school they want or the school that was most appropriate. It is about the exceptional circumstances of their case. So it's a very different um, beast. That in and of itself will take quite a long time to process, it always does. You couldn't simply say, have the forms been processed right? Which is essentially the gist of, or has there been a mistake in the process? Which is essentially the, the basis of what um, the A-level and GCSE side of it would be. Similarly, as part of this, there's the opportunity with GCSE and A-levels. Uh, as they reach a completion point in 2021, uh, there is the option, if you like, for those to, if you like, take a, a, a the equivalent of a reset and take a, a second test to enable those marks to, to feed in uh, in connection with that. Clearly, that is not the same as if, as if you're talking about at the year, end of year eight, moving into year nine. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Minister. Thank you, Minister, for that. Um, you did uh, lean into towards the end of the answer something that I'd like maybe a little bit more information on. This is a, a one-time only test for these young people, and unlike GCSEs and A-levels, they will not get uh, a chance to reset that. And on the, the Chair's point earlier on with regard to the Coronavirus Act 2020, in the developing weeks and days that are, uh, are coming now, and when the picture fully builds of the probably the, the um, the, the pressures that these young people are facing and, and the scale of it. Will you look at the Coronavirus Act 2020? And given that this is a private test, will you perhaps intervene to ensure that, that, that the, our children are protected are, and are kept at the centre of this uh, debate? I always want to engage, but I don't want to give people any level of uncertainty, false fears or expectations, because I've also had different emails from different people on, on different sides of this taking, taking views. Some people are very concerned about even any conversation about postponement as well on that basis. So there, there is a range of views out there. I will not be bringing forward legislation to abolish academic selection. And in effect, if we are to say that the tests are to be put off or removed in some way, I think they can only be, in terms of timescale, moved back. If there is a timescale which enables properly people to transfer, it appears that that is not the case. And similarly, if they are to be put off completely, then that leaves the void of what is put in. So that is think, where I think there is a reluctance. I don't want to give people a false expectation of what is potentially likely to happen. Mr. Mervyn, story. I'll be a principal speaker, and I also, as a member of the policing board, uh, concur with the comments that have been made in relation to my friend and colleague, and we wish him well. Uh, Minister, you made reference during your statement about the need to have a discussion, and it was mentioned by other members, in relation to when the schools will reopen. One of the concerns that we are picking up across our constituencies is that detail of information, given the fact that schools, uh, while they're closed in, in real terms, but the term will come to an end in a few weeks' time, in June, the time for that engagement is running out. Will you give uh, consideration to trying to have more of that conversation so parents do know what will happen in September when schools in a graduated way will return. Okay. First of all, you know, as much certainty as we provided as earlier, I think we are talking about ultimately the ways of detail in relation to it. I think one constraint that is, that is there, there are different ways that you could phase schools. There are different ways, for instance, that the school week could be done, and that may well be that it's quite different what is done, for instance, in primary school to what is appropriate within post-primary school, because there's particular subject matters, for instance. Part of the idea is to have the maximum level of engagement, and so therefore, 
and there isn't a blueprint off the shelf that can simply be pulled down anyway, but if there was and said this is exactly the way this is going to work out, that would in many ways negate the whole purpose of that detailed engagement. I think we want to give as much certainty as possible. There is a, a, a space of time. Now, I suspect at least there is a little bit of opportunity. Um, one constraint that maybe isn't there to the same extent, there will be, and some of that detail will be worked out, will have to be worked out, not just over the next handful of weeks, but over the summer as well. I suppose where there is a degree of advantage will be that it's unlikely that there are too many people leaving on holidays over that period, so at least that, that will have a level of, of constraint. Uh, look, there are a wide range of issues that will need to be tackled through that. It will be around issues about how social distancing is brought up, what the timetable will be, um, for example, what hygiene arrangements will be there, even down to nitty-gritty details that if a school, for instance, is reopening and they're doing different years in a that how will they do that in terms of uh, pickups and um, sort of, you know, in terms of leaving children off. So there's a whole range of issues. I want to have those in-depth conversations and there'll be a lot of work that, that, that will be done. But what I wanted to give today was particularly the certainty around saying that there will not be any overall opening of schools this term, that we're looking to do key cohorts in the third week of August and schools on that phased approach from the beginning of September. And that, and there's a range of ways that, that that can be done. And I think those will be what the detail will need to be scoped out. Thank you, Minister, for his reply. And obviously, that all will come at a cost because uh, it will probably require additional uh, maybe facilities or additional teachers uh, for it to be managed or additional staff in some other way. Uh, what concerns would you have in relation to ensuring that the additional monies that would be required for that, given your budget has been uh, considerably constrained and given the fact that you have found an additional £8 million to deal with the issue of substitute teachers, uh, clearly there will be a need for your department to have consideration to the financial implications to implement that plan? One of the, the work streams that we will be looking at will be the financial asks in relation to this. However, I think it is important to realise, and I, I want to be fair to all departments and across the board, there is a lot of pressure out there on budgets. A lot of money has been allocated, but there is not um, some large pool of money which is going to be available. So a lot of this, whereas I, I would hope in terms of the budget allocation for 2021, there will be some extra money overall for schools, which will help with the, the broad bit of school budget. Will there be money particularly for additional staff or a wide range of things additionally, I, I think it's, that's unlikely and I don't want to give people a misleading impression. So this will have to be both in terms of from existing budgets, existing staff, it will have to be how that this can be best operated in, a, in an inventive form which can help deliver. That, that is not going to be easy. But to take an example, where in some schools there will be particularly say some teaching staff that will have to shield. Clearly, if, the, if, if, that, if that member of staff is ill, then there, there's clearly provision for a substitute. But part of that will also be that if somebody is able to work from home, it may well be that the, the balance of responsibilities will, will shift a bit so that those who have to work from home will have a much greater role in delivering remote learning. Those who are in the classroom will have a much higher percentage of the uh, delivery within the classroom. So it, it is about actually shifting some of those responsibilities as well. But I, you know, and some of this will have levels of inescapable costs, I've no doubt. But I don't want to give people false impressions that there will be some large sum of money that will be available because, frankly, from the executive point of view, I, I would love it if, I'm not going to stand in the way if the finance minister or the executive wants to give large amounts of money to me. As I'm sure I know there's a former minister in here as well that if, if education gets more money, it can always spend it um, and spend it very wisely in that regard. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Well, let's not get into a bit of revisionism here in that regard. But the likelihood of there being some large sums of money additionally to what's been there put into education are highly unlikely. So it is actually about people thinking through how we can actually cope with the current situations, and that will not be perfect, from largely speaking existing budgets. There will be issues around free school meals. There will be issues around probably additional issues around cleaning, for instance, that will lead to inevitable additional costs. Beyond that, it is, there will not be a pot of gold for anybody out there to be able to spend. Okay, members, uh, we're now halfway through the hour, and six members have got asking their questions and supplementaries. At the current rate, that means 12 will get asking, which also means Ms Sheeran, Ms Bradshaw, Mr Hilditch, Mr McGuigan, Mr Wells, Ms Woods and Mr Carroll will not get asking their questions. 
So can we please pick up the pace, short, sharp questions and short, sharp answers. I call Ms Catherine Kelly. Minister, thank you for your statement today and specifically for the update on childcare and the situation currently. Um, we know how crucial this sector is um, to our society um, and we, there's a big job of work ahead um, to ensure sustainability. Um, has there been any consideration given to how the childcare sector can play a role um, when schools close for the summer? Well, look, in the, the broader level, obviously the funding package at present, I, I, I take on board what the um, Deputy, Principal Deputy Speaker said. I'm not quite sure, having read out the list of names, that was an incentive to be succinct or to be more long-winded um, on my part. Um, no, look, there is a package which is there, which is likely probably to be, uh, may not necessarily all be spent within that, that period, so there may be something ongoing. I think it's widely recognised by the executive um, the importance of childcare. Again, I'm not breaching any particular confidence. I think there's a need and widely accepted within executive members that there will need to be a specific conversation on childcare beyond simply what is there in terms of the schools um, situation. Um, and the member is right, both in terms of the broad ability of people to get back to work, um, the ability of provision to be made, childcare will, will be a critical aspect and therefore I think there will need to be very specific additional focus on it beyond simply what's happening within the schools. Thank you for your response, Minister, and I'm glad to hear that the executive as a whole are um, taking it very seriously. Um, can you outline if your department, alongside other departments, has started the process of planning? Um, has there been conversations um, on that, and has the plans been put into place, especially now as we know that the reference group um, has been set up in relation to the scheme, and can the, scheme, the reference group be used um, you know, and ensuring that there's, you know, a proper process of sustainability for the childcare sector and the other side of COVID-19. Uh, the childcare, the reference group, will have a critical role to do in that. Obviously, in terms of the mechanics, it's largely being handled by the business service organisation and with DOH. I think there's, there's good work has been done, mentions made last week, I think, where there has been levels of disjoint on trying to real, align, for instance, the DOH definition of key workers with... Uh, uh, but there, there's a wider bit which is beyond simply where the funding package is at, at present because as we see it's not just a contribution to the wider economy but for childcare settings themselves a, a lot of businesses will ultimately be able to reopen on the basis of restrictions with, with social distancing it will create inconvenience for them but no more than that there will be a greater level of difficulty for childcare facilities if they are to try and operate with only a fraction of their of their children so that has got to be something that's got to be taken into account as well I call Ms. Michelle McElveen. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Principal Deputy Speaker, I very much welcome the statement by the Minister and particularly the support um, being given for substitute teachers. And of course, I'm not really sure whether to be thanking him or others because, as we know, success has many fathers. But regardless of the amount of um, teaching resources which are available, and I appreciate the very hard work of, of teachers in providing these, parents and carers are really key to the success of homeschooling. And for many, this has proved extremely challenging. The amount of direct engagement between um, parents and their child's teacher, particularly at primary level, has varied considerably, and most of this is voluntary on the part of the parents. Was a standardised approach ever considered? I think the, the aim will be, and I think that's where the link officers are working, and particularly with, with ATI, uh, to try and move much closer towards a standardised approach as much as possible. How much that can ever be entirely policed, shall we say, is, is going to be very difficult. But if there's availability of online resources, if there is a much more aligned work between the system and schools as a whole, I think that that will be, will be helpful. And I think, funnily enough, while it will create a, a blend of um, homeschooling and classroom schooling, uh, may actually create a, an awful lot of great challenges for teachers. I think the fact of the, the much greater in, involvement of the, of the classroom and therefore being able to, to give stuff directly uh, will be of assistance to both uh, parents and also to pupils. Ms. McElveen. Happy to give way for someone else. Mr. John O'Dowd. Thank you, Pre-Blask and Collier. Uh, I wasn't going to ask the Minister about academic selection, but I feel I'm forced to speak up on behalf of those parents who are not putting their children forward for academic rejection. Those parents who care about their children's education, those parents who love their children as much as any other parent. Will the Minister assure this House that he will use his energies and resources in the Department of Education
to represent all children, not just those who are now currently involved in a debate about the needs of institutions, not the needs of children. Because I am concerned the Minister is distracted in the wrong direction at this time. Well, I'm glad it wouldn't really be a question time without the former member asking something on academic selection. So, whereas I think it's very popular to have uh, obviously a populist phase of the new normal, it's, it's good. It's, it is kind of reassuring to get an occasional shaft back into the, um, of light back into the, uh, into the old normal on that basis. Look, uh, we're dedicated to try to uh, do everything for uh, all children. I suppose particularly we're looking at where, as mentioned in the statement, the specific measures are going to put in place for vulnerable children. And I think on a wide range of families, irrespective of their views on selection, irrespective of whether they're involved with selection, have their child in for a test, not in for a test, all are equally merits of, of attention and support. And I think as part of the continuity of, of learning project that we'll be looking at, is what level of support can be given to, to all children. So I, I'm happy to try and treat all children equally and give them that, that fullest of level of support as I can. Well, I, I just want to emphasise to the Minister, I don't want him to try. I want him to treat all children equally in, in, in the system. Would the Minister agree with me that in terms of an alternative, there is an alternative. Those schools that currently practice academic selection can bring children in under the same system as every other post-primary school. Indeed, the majority of schools are doing. And ending academic selection does not end grammar schools. Grammar schools is a management type. It has nothing to do with academic selection. With respect, on it, I think the key driver for a grammar school is a level of academic selection. Uh, you know, there is, I suppose, um, I think Churchill talked about after the First World War, uh, that after all that had happened within the war, the dreary steeples of Tyrone and Fermanagh uh, re-emerged, i.e. the arguments in this part of the world then resurfaced after all that had happened. Uh, it seems to be that COVID virus will come and go, and probably the arguments over academic selection will, will, uh, will still uh, remain. Mr Justin McNulty. Can I begin with expressing my condolences with the, to the family of John Murphy, RIP, um, friends and former teammates. John Murphy was a great down player. He won the All Ireland in 1968 and scored a crucial goal in the final against Kerry. And a few years earlier, he won a McCrory Cup with the Abbey. Um, my dad played full back on that team, and he was a very important selector on the down team in 91, 94 All Ireland winning teams. And he also was a selector of Mayo Bridge, a very successful Mayo Bridge club team. Um, huge admiration for the man. His picture was on the wall in my school, and um, even though he's a down man, I have huge admiration for him. He was a great Gael. So, um, sorry for, for the loss to his family, and I must leave Groshe. Minister, you mentioned the restart programme, um, but unfortunately, there is still no plan. I understand the complexities in relation to shielding of members of staff, in relation to uh, social distancing uh, necessities. Have you given consideration in terms of workforce availability and is there any thought or consideration be given to the possibility of using community centres or community halls to increase the space so that the continue of, continuation of learning, continuity of learning is more possible or is more, more enhanced through having more kids being taught when they return to school? I think from that point of view, obviously, um, and certainly with the members' current haircut, I'm certainly not going to argue with them uh, at present. Uh, but, uh, look, certainly from that point of view, in terms of moving ahead, I think uh, where we can look at any levels of solutions and if there's any innovative solutions, obviously uh, we've got to make sure that whatever facilities available are, um, are compatible with child protection issues and that side of it as well. Um, I think particularly where there will be a particular role for the community, I think that they can provide a critical bridge, particularly over the summer. And I think that, that issues around some of the provisions that are there, um, and particularly summer schemes. It's going to be both in terms of the role that community and voluntary and private sectors can play in relation to that, but also a level of permission. Look, from that point of view, in terms of the detail of this, uh, yes, the point is, I suppose, we're at the beginning of a journey of recovery. To that extent, I think that it will be a critical element in terms of the engagement to scope out and get the detail on those issues, get down to the nitty-gritty. And in certain regards, as I said, even if even I was sitting here and it'd be a wiser man than myself who had a, a blueprint of everything that precisely was going to be happening come September, I think that that would be foolhardy to, to do that anyway without that level of engagement. I think that there is a wider and various levels of support that can be provided and is being provided uh, by the community. And I think, as with a lot of things with COVID, it can bring out the, the best of 
the best as well, and that level of support, I think, is something that would be useful as well. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. Would the Minister join with me in paying tribute to our head teachers, our principals, to our teaching staff, to our support staff, who have been completely disrupted and have had their roles completely um, reconstituted, but have managed to do their very best to help the kids that they are responsible for, and have made extraordinary efforts uh, to date, and are continuing to make extraordinary and are determined to continue to make extraordinary efforts to help educate our, our young people. I, no, I'm happy to associate myself with the remarks that the members made and add that level of thanks to the, everybody within the educational sector. I think one of the positives, I mean, while there's a lot that can worry us about, about the, the current situation, a lot of negatives, and there will be negatives for years to come, there is a lot of good work that has come out of this. The extent to which everybody within sectors has pulled together. Um, I don't know if anybody's trying to, at this point, uh, pretend not to be guilty whenever they hear the phone going off. Um, but uh, from that point of view, uh, I think that some of the innovation, both the, the hard work, the, the extent to which we've seen a lot of people within the educational sector go absolutely the extra mile beyond, I think, is to be commended. I think there's innovation that has arisen out of this, which would suggest that even if we were in a position to go perfectly, go this Monday back to what previously passed for normal, I think there's lessons to be learned and things to be put in place. So I'm certainly I'm happy to echo the remarks of the, of the member. Mr Mike Nesbitt. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in terms of the new norms the Minister referenced in his speech, uh, would he agree that the current policy of only providing free meals to qualifying pupils during term time has no basis in logic, in that if a child is going to go hungry in May and June, they're at equal risk in July and August, and the executive needs to join the department in addressing this? Well, from that point of view, there has always been, in terms of free school meal entitlement, it's to ensure those who are attending school uh, that whether they be there under the care of the school are getting that, that provision of lunch. I, mean, look, I understand the logic of what the member is saying. I am simply making the point that this has not been something that was done up until now. It will require a considerable level of additional resource if that is the case. Now, it does strike me that probably one of the things that may well need to be looked at is if the Department of Communities is looking at the providing food for all those who are vulnerable within our society, that may well be the best route to which that can be provided. But there's no point in me pretending that there's money from the Department of Education to be able to do that over the summer. There, there simply isn't. We were talking maybe somewhere in the region of up to £20 million additional, which there's no budget for. So it will be a question overall in terms of what happens over the summer for the executive as a whole. But I don't want to mislead people that there is a pot of money which I can simply draw down as Minister of Education. I'm not saying that it's the responsibility of your department only. It is a cross-cutting. Uh, measure Minister, and if you are bringing it up to the Executive, as I hope you will, uh, you could point out that in the 14 outcomes in the draft programme for government framework, tackling holiday hunger, hunger will tackle at least four of those. We have a more equal society, we enjoy longer, healthier, more active lives, we care for others and we help those in need. And the clincher for me to take to the Executive is we give our children and young people the best start in life. Tackling holiday hunger has to be a tick box for that. Well, I, I don't disagree with anything that the member has said, but in terms of tick box, you know, this is not, um, and to be fair to the executive as a whole, it is not a question of, at the moment, of choosing between good spend and bad spend. You know, we're in a situation that, given some of the pressures that are there, there has already been, I think, over a billion pounds that have been allocated um, through COVID. If the executive had the money, it could, and meeting good schemes could double that. On that basis. There's got to be a point, though, at which there will have to be choices that, that will be made. And I'm just putting that as a caveat. Are we saying that, that what the member said is something that is very virtuous and will actually be something that is very good? I, I completely agree with them in that regard. But so too will be a range of other things which uh, are, at the moment, have not been able to be um, afforded. So it will be a question for the overall executive to decide. Mrs Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for his statement. I'd like to draw his attention to the educational restart. The Minister will be aware that there's a lot of anxiety at present, um, particularly being bandied around in the mainland with regard to the safety of, of pupils returning to school. So, by way of reassurance, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I would ask the Minister um, what consideration he will give to adapting or indeed adopting um, what is working in other countries uh, across the world that are further along this process? 
Well, look, I think one of the advantages that we have in looking at um, how we move forward, obviously we've got to have solutions that are bespoke to Northern Ireland, but there are a number of countries that um, both the fact that it, is, it seems likely that this will kick in at some stage in, in June in England, and we'll be able to, to learn from that. And there's shared experience we're having with other jurisdictions, but also we'll be closely monitoring. We've seen, for instance, um, I know most people would not see me as a great Eurocrat in that, in that regard, but we've seen, for example, of what has happened in various European countries, in Germany, in Denmark, and various other places, and I think we can learn, generally speaking, from sometimes, and see what works and what doesn't work, maybe traps to avoid on that basis. Um, and there are those, those conversations. And, you know, for instance, uh, I know there's a very innovative approach, for instance, being taken in Germany in terms of uh, the way they approach getting groups back to school. There does seem to be a range of, of constants, one of which is there seems to be, uh, while we've got to be careful that doesn't, people don't regard this as simply safe, that, for example, the, the, the evidence which is there will create a bit of a differential between very young children and older children. And it may well therefore be that precisely as we move ahead, the solutions for a six-year-old will not be the same as the solutions for a 16-year-old. And that will be on a whole range of issues. So I, I think it's important uh, that we do look outwards in terms of what, what has worked and try to take that, that level of advice. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, within the Minister's statement, he has outlined that there's been a huge amount done, rightly, um, for those who were in pre-measured hardship prior to this crisis, and that's fair. Um, however, I would draw his attention to the working poor, um, who are increasing in number, and to those who are just about getting by and who are falling through the stools for help. And I would ask the Minister to take that into account um, with his policies going forward. And on the back of that, um, I know it's not fully the Minister's remit, but since he provides some of the money, I wish to draw uh, to an issue to his attention that I would request he take back to his executive colleagues. And I'm asking for clarity around the child care, child minding provision, because as society opens up and people are being called back to work, they're not, they're not able to avail of grandparents to look after their children. And so the opening of schools or provision for those children, for workers being called back to work, the opening of schools, the provision of child care, and provision of child minding is becoming critical and we're reaching a grave and urgent need for clarity and time frames. I, I think that's a very valid point. I think I'll make a couple of points in relation to it. That is why I think there, there does need to be something that's quite bespoke for the child care and child minding sectors, um, which takes into account of the contribution it makes to schools but um, moves in a, in a wider context. I mean, it's noticeable that I think since the scheme has been there, in terms of the levels of interest, there has been... Um, for instance, a more limited interest in the approved child care individual scheme, but a much greater interest than maybe anticipated in the child minder side of it. So part of the stuff as well is I think there has been, and to be fair to the finance department, in terms of some of the spend on that, uh, they have given a level of flexibility to the scheme to be able to vary between different, different sides of it. It is the case that we also need to ensure that what is there is something that can operate in the, the long run, uh, which will support that. The points that we made in terms of the broader support for all, all children, I think, are also um, critical, uh, critical as well. What it also, uh, I think, bears in mind, particularly in terms of uh, it will be, which I think some of the executive um, is obviously considering and will be looking at, is also the level of connections that are there within families. So at the moment, everything is centred in very much in the household of those who are there. And it may well be that, for instance, child mining responsibilities that maybe previously would have been taken by grandparent, uh, that's no longer applicable. We need to see particularly where there can be flexibility around issues. So were there other relatives, for example, who find themselves that they're in a position to be able to provide that, that we don't create artificial barriers and say, sorry, you can't come into this house because you're not either a registered child mind or, or be a member of the household. You know, I think those are, those, that has got to be part of the wider discussion as we look at the flexibility around, around levels of recovery as well. Okay, members, there's eight more people wanting to speak. There's 10 minutes left. Um, I can keep the minister here slightly over an hour, but I can't keep him here for an hour and a half. And uh, all the main government parties have got asking questions, and therefore I'm going to the bottom of the list before I return to the list again. I call Rachel Woods. 
Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I appreciate that slight sw switch around. Um, as the Minister will be aware, there is a growing campaign against post primary examinations occurring this year, given that we are in a global health pandemic and indeed ever again. And I note your confirmation, or sorry, the Minister's confirmation, that he will not be legislating to abolish this and will be looking at other alternatives if needed. Can I ask the Minister to outline what exact powers have schools over setting admissions criteria for post primary education? In terms of detail, um, I suppose schools have got in terms of power of criteria, they can, within that, have the power to use academic selection as a route to do that, and obviously a range of schools want to, to do that. Um, you know, in terms, of, I'm sure we could provide the, the member with more sort of technical answer in relation. I'll be happy to do that in the terms of brevity. With that, um, um, Minister, um, on a different matter, uh, would the Minister commit to involving and adequately resourcing the community and voluntary sector in all planning going forward to help those facing holiday hunger this year in conjunction with the Minister of Communities as they are a crucial part um, of helping families and children in the local areas, as he will be aware? Well, um, I think it's a critical role to be played by the community and voluntary sector. Ultimately, in terms of funding the community and voluntary sector, it's really a responsibility for the Department for Communities. we will be happy to work, uh, work with them. I have to say, and particularly at the moment, in terms of maybe some of the challenges that are coming down the road, I don't probably have sufficient budget to necessarily cover all of those. Um, I'm sure the Minister of Communities would be very happy for me to help out financially, um, with it, but unfortunately we don't have those, those resources. But I think a lot of this is also about imaginative thinking rather than necessarily even just purely resources. Mr Jerry Carroll. Thank you for using your discretion as well. Uh, I know there's been a strong element of teacher passion in England, and I hope this isn't uh, or doesn't become the case here. And I want to pay tribute to teachers and all education workers, like others have done, who work hard throughout the year and who are ready to return to work uh, when safe to do so. The minister will obviously be aware of the growing calls uh, among students, teachers, their families about the need to suspend upcoming exams for this year. I want to commend and pay tribute to one of those parents. Debbie Hughes-Johnson and her daughter, uh, Ellie, who are challenging uh, this through the courts. And instead of a pat on the back and a thank you to our young people who have heeded the public health measures, uh, we're punishing them by forcing them to sit uh, exams, which we know in and of themselves are very stressful uh, for them. There is no evidence-based reason why the transfer test should continue, not only for this year, but indefinitely. Does the Minister, does the minister believe does the Minister not believe that, given the fact that GCSE and A-level exams have correctly been suspended for this year, that we are effectively punishing primary six pupils by not doing the same for those expected to sit the transfer test later this year? The well, short answer is no. But the, um, the position, obviously, is, first of all, nobody is actually, in fact, any test, nobody is actually forced to sit a test. So that's like, there's a limited amount I can say, as you mentioned, in terms of an ongoing uh, potential court challenge in, in relation to that. I would highlight that irrespective of anyone's views on the nature of transfer, on the nature of tests, there is a very different situation between the level of, even the level of data that is there for pupils who are 16, 17 and 18 and have a wide range of, of data which can be used by CCA to make a level of judgment in terms of um, grades involving also a level of teacher assessment and someone who is at, at primary school where the most robust actual independent data would be from P5. Mr. Carroll. Thank you. I mean, the reality is having the transfer test later this year will exacerbate the class divide that already exists across classrooms. With those who are uh, able to afford private tuition being in an elevated and advantageous position, those unable to afford extra t uh, tuition and resources, those with disabilities, those with underlying health conditions, likely to return to school later than September, place at a further uh, disadvantage. And effectively, what we're doing is we're lab labelling children as failures at the age of 11. Well, I thank the member for the member's desire for a level playing field, and I'm sure, therefore, he's been very supportive of the decision I made a few years ago to ensure that primary schools were able to, were given the freedom to prepare uh, for the transfer test. And I welcome his belated support for that preparation for the transfer test. Mr. Jim Wells, uh, I'm glad the minister hasn't gone down the same route as Mr. McNulty, Mr. Hilties, myself. And you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and having savage haircuts, and I think it's an indication of the times. I think it will destroy all of our modelling careers for a good few months. Uh, I must declare an interest in this because I have a daughter who's about to have her se my second uh, grandchild, which of course will be the second most wonderful grandchild on the planet after the first one. But what guidance has he given 
teachers, and of course it's a very predominantly female, young female workforce. What guidance is he going to give to those teachers who are expecting a baby within the next few months, how they are going to deal with the obvious problems that they will encounter as a result of the virus? I'm tempted to say probably the first bit of advice is it probably won't be a big check in the post from Jim Wells in, in relation to that. Uh, but in terms, of, in terms of that, there would be specific guidance. There has already been specific guidance from a public health point of view that has been offered in terms of PPE, in terms of public distancing, or sorry, social distancing, and a range of other things. Obviously, as part of that, uh, there is a clear desire from the, the initial conversations that I've had with school teachers that they want. On the one hand, it is perfectly proper that they will want that level of engagement and input into that, but they also want as clear a guidance as, as possible. Particularly on issues such as that, will be driven very much by the health considerations, and so forth. We'll be looking to cooperate closely with the likes of the Department of Health and Public Health Agency in providing that bespoke guidance, particularly to, for instance, those who are pregnant or those who would have, um, for instance, medical conditions. And I think that will also be followed in any guidance that is, that is provided. Mr. Wells, Health have actually produced very useful guidance for their staff in a similar position. And would it be possible for him to liaise with his colleagues? in the department to agree a joint policy? From that point of view, I know that there has been specific ad advice that has been provided and has been passed on. The issue, I suppose, is we will need to take a look at what the applicability, and, and that is, if you like, for the situation of the limited opening at present that is there of schools. I suppose that will, part of this will need to make sure that, that what is there is advice which is applicable in the situation of a school which is uh, any phased opening, phase where a certain percentage, for instance, of the, the pupils will be in place. Some of that will also be actually, I think, a certain level of myth, myth busting because there will be people, understandably very concerned, but maybe overly worried and be looking for particular levels of protection which aren't maybe necessarily needed on that basis. So it is about getting that reassurance and providing that guidance so that what is provided matches uh, with what is needed and therefore could provide that level of reassurance, particularly in the individual circumstances are outlined. I think I call Ms. Emma Sheeran. I thank the Minister for his statement and um, I just want to acknowledge the work that's going on at the minute uh, in all schools across the north and indeed uh, further afield and I say that as the sister of someone who's working as a teacher in England and made the decision at the start of this to stay over there and she's volunteering and she's working one day a week but as you said yourself we will at some stage return uh, to school openings and you referred to the new normal and I wondered if you could give us an idea of the type of equipment and PPE and school sanitisation that's going to be uh, required when we do open and whether or not schools are going to receive notification of that. Well, at the moment, in terms of PPE, there is availability of a level of stock. The Finance Minister, and also in cooperation with the Health Minister, made available to other departments and indeed to other arm's length bodies a, a sort of a pool, if you like, of PPE stock, which could be made available upon request. That, that's obviously also going to be something which marries in with the, the particular level of need. In terms of some of the details, I, I, I've given indications that there will be detailed guidance will be provided. In terms of what is precisely required, that will need to be directly scoped out. And what, again, may be applicable within, say, a primary school may not necessarily be exactly the same specifications to be there in a post-primary school. It is critical, I think, that there will be um, a range of additional provision that will be, re be required and we'll be working to scope those out and try to, again, take the very clear-cut advice of health professionals and, indeed, working alongside the likes of the, the trade unions to make sure that, that what is needed is what is got and is what is then delivered on the ground. Thank you. So you're saying that it will be provided for centrally, and will schools be receiving notification of who's responsible? Say, for example, if uh, schools have to be sanitised, will there be notification going out who's responsible for carrying out that, or will teaching staff and classroom assistants be expected to carry that out themselves? Actually speaking, um, while it's not something which... And some schools will go out to... Um, those beyond the year. Largely speaking, in most schools, they will use the education authority from the cleaning service to be able to, to do that. Um, that has inevitably, for instance, even within the, the, the period, led to additional costs and that, but which have been met uh, on that, that cleaning side of it. But there will be very clear guidance that will be given uh, to schools about what will, be, what will be needed, what will be required, and what provision will be made. Thomas Paula Bradshaw. 
Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, um, for your statement today. And I would like to thank you personally for dealing with those individual constituency queries. I wish other um, ministers were quite as diligent at um, MLA's individual requests. Um, saying that, I would like to associate myself with my colleague Chris Little's comments earlier regarding the transfer test. Minister, my um, question relates to the issue of children who are in key worker schools at the minute. I have a constituent whose eight-year-old son with autism was arbitrarily um, told that just last week that he could not return because he couldn't practice social distancing. So I'm wondering what you're going to do about the, the um, children with autism at the minute. Thank you. Okay, I thank the member, um, and I thank her for at least the first 30 seconds of her question <laughs> in relation to that. Look, what, one of the things, and one of the areas that we're looking at in terms of the work streams will be, and it's not simply within um, the special schools, but actually what particular provision will need to be given for children with special educational needs and sometimes medical needs. Uh, and I think what we need to ensure, therefore, is as much as possible what can be provided is tailored for, for those needs on a, an individual basis where possible. Obviously, I'm not aware of the individual uh, case, but uh, there's an acceptance that this is not simply a one-size-fits-all for all children, and we need to work out what level of provisions can be put. And there has been, I think, good work has been done um, with for instance, some of the special schools at present, and I understand there's levels of anxiety still though, around those, and that's where the interdisciplinary team, in terms of um, some um, special, some children with, with critical needs, is also being sort of considered. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, just moving on then, in terms of the principles of those special educational needs schools, when will you be engaging with them around the reopening? Well, that will be part of the, the process. Indicated that uh, there is, as well as the broader strategic level, which we're looking at a level of, of input, uh, there is also, I think, six work streams, one of which is dealing with special education. So I think particularly it will be very useful for levels of discussion with that. But from that point of view, where school principals are looking to contact the Department of Education and contact me, I'm always happy to get that information and have as many conversations as possible. Call Mr. David Hilditch. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Principal, Deputy Speaker, and uh, take the opportunity to thank the members uh, of the House and the uh, officers of the Assembly for their support, both publicly and privately, over the last few days. Thank you. Uh, Minister, thank you for the uh, statement this afternoon. Uh, you mentioned the, the laptop provision will be prioritised to the disadvantaged and the vulnerable, but also to certain groups who will be doing their exams and tests in the coming year. Uh, is it part of a wider plan for mitigating educational loss for these key uh, groups? Uh, yeah, it would be very much so. I mean, look, I think the aim will be to try to make sure there is provision for everyone. And the point is about in terms of the prioritisation is to have some level of sequencing so that as things become available. Uh, they are made available. It is also the case that you mentioned in relation to uh, mitigation on the basis of key examinations, which is why, and it seems to be a, something which is accepted across different jurisdictions, on the post-primary level, what would be our equivalent of, of years 11 and 13, where people are starting GCSE and A-levels, are seen as probably the, uh, the most important cohort, cohorts within the, the post-primary side of it. And I suspect that's why, for instance, as part of the overall uh, examination on um, looking at perhaps a bit of an earlier start, that those cohorts and also those in the transition year and the final year of primary school would also be concentrated on um, for perhaps an earlier start than others on that basis. But yes, the, 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 the IT side of it is one element of the, the broader, but again, part of this is trying to be inventive with, with resources as much as possible. Um, I think there will also be a broader challenge, which I think will be accepted across different jurisdictions, uh, that there would probably need to be some level of alteration to curriculum as we move ahead, because I think, again, no matter how good the work that has been done, um, as we move ahead, there will be some implications for that. But I think that's something which will need to be accepted on a wider basis. I think it's likely to be, but with implications not just for here, but other jurisdictions as well. Mr. Hilton, will the Deputy Speaker I'll not delay the Minister any further? No, it's a busy schedule. A sentiment which I'm sure will be shared by Mr. Philip McGuigan. Karen <laughs> Elgood, uh, pretty last can call you. And before I ask my question, can I also put on record, uh, on behalf of myself and my party, uh, our condemnation uh, of the threat towards Mr. Hildage made earlier in the week? Minister, thank you for your statement and uh, the sentiments contained within it, particularly uh, as others have indicated about schools reopening, that they, this must be led by medical uh, and scientific evidence to ensure safety of staff and pupils 
alike. Uh, I mean, it's pretty clear even at this stage that there will, can't be one size fits all for uh, the preparation of opening schools. Different schools uh, will require uh, different, and different settings will require different criteria, whether it's because of the number of pupils enrolled, because of the space internally and outside of the school, and because, I mean, as you, as you said yourself, uh, transport to and from schools and resources available. So I'm asking the Minister, does he agree with that sentiment? And will there be a level of flexibility allowed to individual schools uh, in terms of the preparation and determine how they can reopen safely? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the, the member raised, I think, a very good point, um, which is both words, the balance of trying to have levels of flexibility in individual circumstances. And it may well be over, that will be over certain practical arrangements that are there. I suppose balanced against that, uh, and I suppose where I'm talking about different positions, again, it may well be that the approach you take to 15-year-olds will be different to 5-year-olds, for instance. And therefore, I think there may well be a level of divergence over what is done precisely, for instance, in primary and post-primary. That may be more in terms of what way weeks are scheduled and that, that side of things. I suppose where the limitations on the level of flexibility will be, we also want to ensure there's a level of consistency for schools. So that we're not, to take one example, here is one school uh, where such and such a year group um, is in class four, times a, four days a week and only at home one day a week, and a school which, because of its circumstances, two miles down the road, the children of that same age are only in sort of one day a week. So I'm taking that, that example. So, you know, I don't particularly want to take a Stalinist type approach, um, which I, I know may disappoint Mr. Carroll uh, on that basis. Uh, but from the, oh, sorry, well, that, that's that's good good to know or whatever. Um, but uh, what I was going to say was, I mean, there will be there will be um, a situation where, so from that point of view, it, it can't be just a command economy which dictates down. But I want to see at least a level of consistency as there, while allowing creating that balance of flexibility. So you know, I think the member raised a very valid point of. How we get the balance of that right, I think, is, is going to be a very tricky question, an easy question. It may well be that even as well, whatever is there on day one or week one may have to have a level of adjustment as we, we move ahead as well, because no one's, no matter how much preparation work is done, no matter how much good thinking and consensus is agreed on, is everything going to be right on the first day? Are there going to be any level of teething problems? Do we know precisely what we expect? I think the answer to all those questions will be, you know, it's, it's, it's likely there will be some level of adjustments as well. Briefly, uh, obviously, uh, we wouldn't uh, ask the minister to take a Stalinist approach, but perhaps he could read some of uh, Marx's uh, writings. Uh, j just uh, following on from the commentary of, of my constituency colleague about additional resources probably being required, I mean, I do think that in some instances extra resources will be required, particularly extra support will be needed for special schools and schools containing uh, pupils with extra special needs. Again, I think it's a valid point. I mean, I'm, I'm probably more of a Menshevik than a Bolshevik in that, in that regard. Uh, but uh, from that point of view, no, look, there is undoubtedly going to be some areas where there are additional pressures, where there will need to be some level of additional resources. To some extent, a lot of that will have to be a, a certain level of creative thinking in terms of where the budget lies. Uh, I mean, clearly, I don't mean this facetiously, but if the, if the member is able to um, uh, work alongside, you know, if, if there's any persuasion he can make of the Minister of Finance to be able to provide some of those, I'll be, I'll be extremely grateful in that regard. Uh, but I, I just want to make sure that people don't have a wrong assumption that there will be a large amount of additional resources, but clearly there will be some pressures. You mentioned, you know, as I said, mentions made of the fact that even just on the issue of entitlement uh, to issues such as free school meals, where we are, for instance, a uniform grant, even if there's no change to any of the criteria anywhere, there will be additional demands on those, which rightly will have to be, will have to be met. I think there is likely to be, um, even leaving aside the, the teaching side of it, there is likely to be additional pressures on things such as um, additional sort of cleaning materials. But there may also be within the, the system um, that may also generate some levels of easements as well. I, I suspect the easements will be far outweighed by the, the additional cost. So it's a mixture of trying to see where additional resources can be got and where they can be effectively recycled. Mr Matthew O'Toole. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I join with others in condemning the appalling uh, threats made against Mr. Hilditch. And good to see him here today and, and, and facing down um, uh, that unacceptable behaviour. Um, Minister, I want to make two statements, which I presume you wouldn't disagree with. One, every single piece of available evidence shows that poor kids have worse outcomes from the 11 plus and transfer tests. 
Number two, basically everyone agrees that poorer kids are more vulnerable to worse educational outcomes as a result of this crisis and the shutdown. That's evidenced by the fact that your department has taken very welcome steps to mitigate that. Would you therefore agree, following those two statements, that proceeding with transfer tests this year will mean poorer kids do worse? Well, with respect to it, nobody is, I, I'm not going to prepare to write off children. I think it's part of this. You know, it is undoubtedly there are inequalities in society. We've got to try and where we can mitigate those. Look, my concern is also is partly um, driven by a belief that if, if there is no academic selection, there's no opportunity for that, we will move, whether it's in the short term or the long term, we will move much more into a situation, as we see in England and other places, where essentially transfer happens and selection, selection will happen in some shape or form because there will always be schools that are oversubscribed and some that are undersubscribed. But if we move to a situation in which academic selection is removed, we move to a scenario in which it is much more likely that we will see the development of those who have got the ability to pay go to the, the best schools. And, you know, there's undoubtedly concerns over, over a level of level playing field. The, the member is right in, in relation. I don't disagree with that. I think the issue is whether we take steps that will create a system in which that level playing field becomes more level or does it become something which uh, advantage of money, and I think if we remove academic selection, it would be more so. Now, given where we are, if there is to be academic selection, there will need to be some form of test, and I think uh, that is axiomatic. I think that the, um, the situation is, I think we've got to put in place as many measures as possible to help all children, irrespective of whether they're doing the test or not, to be able to recover from that level of, of the disruption in terms of the continuity of, of learning. Are we going to be in a perfect situation? I don't think anybody is pretending otherwise. Briefly, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I take it from that answer that the Minister doesn't um, dissent from the statements I made, and, I, and I'm grateful for that. Um, can I very briefly ask him uh, if a single parents group or teaching union or other relevant stakeholder group has got in touch with them to say they support transfer tests proceeding this autumn? Yeah, there have been certainly parents who have been in touch. I mean, look, the teaching unions have a long standing position. It will not come as a great surprise that I think pretty much all teaching unions at least have an official position against, against academic selection. Uh, it would be somewhat, if, if given the long-standing position, and it's a very sincerely, and you know, I appreciate across this chamber there will be different views. If suddenly I was to find a teaching union in current circumstances suddenly say actually it reversed its opinion and was supportive of academic solution, it would be somewhat of a Damascine conversion on that, that basis. I'm not anticipating it. But amongst parents, there's a wide range of, um, of views. I think also set against that is also the issue of what the practicalities are. And for a lot of parents, yes, they will express a view, for instance, that they would like to see the test put off, but they are still in favour of, of academic selection on that basis. The problem, as I indicated with that, is doing that in a timescale which actually enables people to transfer properly. And transfer from primary to post-primary is a complex process. Um, it is not something which can simply be truncated to a couple of weeks on that basis. And I think that's where the problem lies in the timing issue. Thank you, Minister. That concludes questions on the statement. Yes? Order, um, you, you fairly reminded me of my responsibility not to speak from a, a seated position. And I'm, I'm grateful genuinely for the expert job you're doing in chairing these sessions. But to be fair, the Minister for Education wholly misrepresented my question regards contingency plans and suspension of post-primary transfer for 2020 as a call to ban grammar education. Can I ask if you'll be reminding the Education Minister of his responsibility not to misrepresent members of this Assembly in order to divert from the inadequacy of his action on matters of public concern? The member may ask a question, and the Minister may not like the question. And the member will get an answer, and the member may not like the answer. It's not the role of the chair to determine on the content of questions or on the content of answers. And I don't really think that that was, strictly speaking, a point of order. But you've got your comments in Hansard, and they're on the record. Agenda item three is the time, date, and place of our next meeting. We've yet to receive confirmation from the executive about when ministers will next come to make statements to the committee. As soon as that confirmation has been received, written notification of the time, date and place of our next meeting 
will be issued to members in the usual way. I would remind members, however, that a plenary session of the Assembly is scheduled to take place on Tuesday the 2nd of June, and that ministers may continue to make oral statements to the Assembly on sitting days. That concludes this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. Meeting is adjourned. Stay safe.